So this is problem number six from the 2022 AP Calc AB exam. Uh, Non-calculator question here, and it involves a couple of particles. And if you check out what they tell us about particle P, it's moving along the x-axis. And as long as time is above zero, the position of it is given by this function of t. Uh, and then particle Q is moving along the y-axis. So it's a little bit weird because one's moving on the x-axis, one's moving on the y-axis. We just have to kind of be aware of that as we progress through this problem. Uh, this is also only going to hold for times that are positive. But notice that we're given a velocity function here. So just be cautious of that as well. We have a position function for particle P, but then we have a velocity function for particle Q. They give us a little bit more information about particle Q at time one. The position of particle Q is one at time one. The Y coordinate is two. So in part A, we're asked to deal with particle P, right? So find the velocity function for particle P as a function of T. So as long as you recognize that this is a position function and velocity is the rate of change of position or that velocity is the derivative of position, it's just a matter of taking a derivative of this position function. Derivative of 6 is 0. I'm able to copy this negative 4, this constant negative 4, into my derivative. And then I do have to use a chain rule for the derivative of e to the negative t. So I'm going to get e to the inner function and then times the derivative of the inner function. You can clean that up a little bit if you wanted to. You could write that as 4e to the negative t. But what I have showing right here would receive full credit as well. Part b, now we need to shift our attention to particle q. So it says find the acceleration function for particle q at time t. So again, it's, it's something that you've probably done many times throughout your calculus course. Accelerations, the rate of change of velocity. This is the velocity function for particle Q. I need to take the derivative of this velocity function to build that acceleration function. So I, I, I could have used a quotient rule here, but anytime I have a, a constant value in the numerator, I'm always going to opt to use some exponent properties and go with a power rule. So I just thought of this as t to the negative second multiply by the exponent, subtract one from it. I cleaned it up a little bit because there is a follow-up portion to this. So this would receive full credit for the acceleration function for particle Q at time T. Uh, this is going to be a little easier for us to analyze in the next step. And the next step is to find all times T, that, again, only dealing with positive times, when the speed of particle Q is decreasing. So... I know that I need to analyze both velocity and acceleration to build a conclusion about speed. When velocity and acceleration have the same sign, they're working together and speed would be increasing. When velocity and acceleration have differing signs, they're working against each other and speed would be decreasing. So I'm thinking about my acceleration function that I just built. And if I'm putting a positive in place of t, my denominator is always going to be positive. My numerator is always going to be negative. Therefore, for positive t's, my acceleration is always less than zero. My acceleration is always negative. Now, the velocity function right here, if, if we put a positive in place of this t, we're dealing with a positive divided by a positive. So acceleration is always negative. Velocity is always positive. Velocity and acceleration are always going to have opposite signs for positive values of time. Therefore, the speed of particle q is decreasing for all times that are positive. Part C asks us to find the position function for particle Q. So we have access to the velocity function for particle Q. This is the rate of change of position or the derivative of position. If we want to work backward to a position function, we're going to have to do an antiderivative. So again, I thought of 1 over t squared as t to the negative second. I applied my power rule for antiderivatives or integrals this time around. I do have to tack on my constant of integration. I cleaned it up a little bit just to make it a little easier to deal with this condition when we plug it in. I put 2 in for the y value. I put 1 in for the time. Solving this equation right here for c gives you a value of 3 for c. So my position function for particle q is completed and right here. And then in the final part of this question, it says, as t approaches infinity, which particle will eventually be farther from the origin? Give a reason for your answer. So distance from the origin. Well, that's going to depend on the position function, right? Particle p is on the x-axis. Particle q is on the y-axis. So whichever one has a, a, a larger... Now, I guess you have to be careful here. If something's negative, we're really considering magnitude, right? It doesn't say, you know, which is... 
it's weird because we've got opposite directions for the motion, but uh, you know, if particle Q is at a position of negative 10 and particle P is at a position of two, although two is a bigger value than negative 10, negative 10 puts us farther from the origin. So you do have to pay attention to how this is worded just in case any negatives pop up. But we have to consider this as time approaches infinity. So we want to know what happens to the position of each of these particles as time goes to infinity. So if you check the limit of the position function for particle p as time approaches infinity, uh, if you think of this as 4 over e to the t, and then put infinity in place of the t, you end up with 6 minus 4 over infinity. That's really going to trend to 0 as the denominator grows and grows and grows. 6 minus 0 is, of course, 6. We do something similar for, now this is dependent on the position function that we just found. So we had to Go back and grab our answer from part C here. I'm checking the limit as time approaches infinity for my position of particle Q. Uh, I put infinity in place of the T in that position function that we had as our conclusion for the prior part to the problem. I do have another fraction here that's trending towards zero as the denominator grows to infinity. Uh, adding three to that gives me a value of three. So we don't run into the issue that I kind of cautioned you of a little bit earlier. Uh, both of these are positives and because we have an X coordinate of six, as t approaches infinity for particle p, and then a y coordinate of 3 as t approaches infinity for particle q. Particle p is going to be the one that's, uh, let's see, I always struggle with this. Farther, I said further. I have no idea what I'm supposed to say. Let me stay consistent with what they said there. Whatever's right, I don't know, but particle p is definitely the one that is a larger magnitude from the origin.